Hello, welcome to another episode of Crops TV Season 3. My name is Marshall McDaniel. I'm an associate professor in soil plant interactions in the agronomy department. My specialty is in soil fertility, soil health, uh, general ag productivity, and I'm going to talk to you in this episode about uh, re-diversifying crop rotations in the Midwest. And I'll, I'll talk more about what I mean and how it might require looking backwards to some older practices, but maybe using newer equipment and um, using some aspects of agriculture that we might have forgotten about in the last several decades. And I'll explain that more here. So before I do that, I just want to uh, give a couple shout outs or acknowledgements. Uh, I want to acknowledge two people in particular, Matt Liebman uh, on the bottom right there, uh, now retired professor emeritus, and Matt Woods that had uh, been working on this long-term experiment I'm going to describe. And Matt Liebman had, had actually established it in 2002. And then a couple of my former students and postdocs, Murganka Day and Rebecca baldwin Cordic, that have now moved on to other jobs. And then some funders that have made this research possible, uh, USDA, Iowa Nutrient Research Center, NSF, National Science Foundation, Iowa Soybean Association, and the Walton Family Foundation. Here's what I'm going to talk about under this topic of benefits of re-diversifying crop rotations. My email is here on the screen. I believe it should be uh, linked to below the video, and you can follow the research that all the great folks in my lab do at the uh, Twitter handle at soil underscore plant underscore IXNS, which is short for interactions, soil plant interactions. And I'm going to be talking about uh, an intro and background of why I mean re-diversifying crop rotations, because that implies that they're not as diverse as they used to be. I'll be talking about soil health findings at this long-term experiment established by Matt Liebman called the Marsden Agroecosystem Diversity Experiment and some of the soil health research we did. Then I'll bring it all together for some previous research that Matt and his colleagues had done even before I started at Iowa State for kind of a comprehensive look and at sustainability under diversified ag systems compared to our business as usual conventional corn soybean rotations. And then I'll talk a little bit about future of uh, work at Marsden that uh, is still up in the air and we're still collecting data on. So you get a kind of a sneak peek of what's to come in the next few years. And then I'm going to just go over some conclusions and, and uh, what can we do to move forward and, and what's the future of rediversifying crop rotations in, the, in Iowa and the rest of the Midwest. All right. So as Iowa farms, so farms the nation, as the saying goes. And this is a graph showing... Uh, from 1860 to 2020, uh, the proportion of cropland in Iowa that was in either corn or soybeans in the orange line, and that's uh, increasing from about 1960 to present day. And the, the small grains line, which is the dashed kind of maroon line that was about the same, you know, between 40 and 60 percent from the 1860s to, to 1940, and then precipitously drops in about the 1950s to 1960s. And then hay, which has remained the same in Iowa at about 10% uh, on average across uh, 1920 to 2020 when the USDA was collecting data on this. And so the, the major take home is that corn and beans are now 95% of Iowa's cropland. Uh, everything else is kind of a marginal crop. And that many factors have contributed to this loss of both small grains being grown in rotations like wheat or oats, but also the inclusion of alfalfa has also declined in, in the past several decades as well. And one of the major factors is just animals are no longer integrated in a lot of farms. Uh, also, instead of horses, we have tractors. So there's not as, a, as a great a demand for um, hay and other socioeconomic factors that have contributed to this uh, specialization in just corn and soybeans. And what I often joke with uh, many of the growers I talk to about this, they always tell me, oh, that's grandpa's rotation. And, and that's really right. I mean, this is a rotation that uh, my grandfather might have done when he was farming in, in Oklahoma and in Southeast Oklahoma. But others around in, that were farming in Iowa were doing more of a rotation, corn, soy, oats, alfalfa. And we'll talk about this experiment that kind of tested that. But 
Um, I just want to show this map of corn and soybean production from 2021. The, the dark green counties are those where very high product productivity. So we have very high productive soils for corn and soybeans. And as that previous graph showed, dominate our agriculture landscape now. But even though we're number one in corn and uh, sometimes number one in, in uh, soybean, depending on the year, we've, we've gotten very good at producing those two grains, but there have been some problems that have been associated with that, at least when it's practice as business as usual. One of them is soil erosion. So besides Iowa being number one in some of those grains, uh, Iowa is number one in the nation for soil erosion, and there are solutions to this. And some farmers are adopting these, these conservation practices, no tillage, cover crops, diversified perennial rotations, which is kind of the topic of this talk. There are also local and regional water quality issues. Some of these same practices can help alleviate these problems on the farm. So no-till, cover crops, diverse, diversified perennial rotations, DPR, and also edge of field practice, so more of an engineering approach by taking the water that might be coming off a field and putting it through a bioreactor buffer strip to reduce nitrogen, um, but also phosphorus from going into surface waters. Another issue that many of you are probably already familiar with is that we've got a deficit of soil organic matter, or soil organic carbon, and that's estimated to be about 50% decline since we put the plow to the fields a, a couple centuries or more ago, depending on where you're looking at. And some of these same practices, no-till, cover crops, diversified perennial rotations, manure, which could be part of those rotations, um, so reintegrating animals, and biochar can all help um, to mitigate this, this specific problem. And then we also have problems that I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, but some of my other colleagues, in, in fact, many of them giving talks probably in this very season of Crops TV, loss of wildlife habitat, you can restore savanna or prairie, and this also alleviates some of these other problems mentioned above as well. And then there's uh, one that often doesn't get talked a lot about, and I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk a lot about it because it's not my expertise, but the kind of socioeconomics factors like farms getting larger, profit margins getting smaller, farmer well-being has been documented to be on the uh, decline. And we don't know the solutions to this, but maybe some of these practices could actually help alleviate this issue as well, especially with the profit margin issue. Okay, so soil health, you've, you've heard the term before, I presume, uh, is all the rage these days. Uh, everyone has their own definition of soil health. I'll give you kind of mine in, in the next slide. But these are all principles of soil health as put forth by the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and they fall under these five principles or categories. Soil armor, minimize disturbance, plant diversity, continual live plant root, what I'll sometimes call perenniality. That's just showing some uh, soybeans there with cereal rye growing in between them. And then livestock integration or, or grazing in, in a rotation or in a, in a cropped field. And some of the practices that fall under each one of these, so cover crops, retaining residue, reducing tillage, restoring to perennial vegetation, CRP or prairie strips, those all can function as soil, improving soil armor, minimizing disturbance. Uh, we can reduce tillage. This is actually a photo in the panel here of some work I did when I was a, a researcher in Australia, uh, a no-till versus tilled experiment. This is a disc plow going through these vertisol soils. So we can reduce tillage, lower compaction with controlled traffic farming, or also uh, use CRP or restored prairie strips. Plant diversity, we could use cover crop mixtures, crop rotations, intercropping, and CRP or prairie strips can also uh, satisfy this principle of soil health. Continual live plant root, cover crops, perennial crops. I'll be talking about that one a little bit more in this session. Uh, relay cropping, CRP, and prairie strips again, or conservation reserve program. And then livestock integration, grazing cover crops is probably the most direct uh, application of this principle, but also seeding pastures in rotation. Or even the fact of just adding manure is at least kind of an indirect way to reintegrate livestock to a cropping system uh, if you could use that rather than a synthetic source of fertilizer. The main factor for the 
uh, those problems I had mentioned a couple slides ago is that we have bare soil for greater than 50% of the year here in Iowa. And so follow me here for a second. This is a bit of a complex graph, but this key on the left shows a, a clock. So think of our, our year as a clock um, and January being at noon or midnight, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, so forth. And I'm gonna show a couple different cropping systems. Uh, one is the, the business as usual. So for most of that year, or not most of it, but 50%, sometimes most, the business as usual or two year rotation has a bare soil. And there are corn and soybeans grown in that wider section that's uh, colored yellow and green. Uh, but the, the thin brown line represents a uh, bare soil where there's no living crop on it. You might have some residue covering it if you're not tilling or, or removing residue. But an alternative to that, one alternative, is adding a winter cover crop. In this case, cereal rye is the crop I'm using here, and that's growing during the what we call the shoulder season. So uh, after uh, corn is harvested or soybeans are harvested, and then before the, the next spring, um, some cover crop growth can occur before a plant is um, seeded in the spring. And there's also uh, a time of senescence when that rye is dormant, and that's during the winter months. That's why it's at the top of that, that clock uh, uh, analogy here. Uh, there are other alternatives too. So besides using a winter cover crop, uh, some growers are using longer diverse rotations. This might include a small grain that overwinters like oats, or uh, uh, winter wheat. And in this case, we start at the corn soybean in uh, uh, April or May. Uh, that then is uh, harvested, and then you can plant that small grain that overwinters. And then we've got two options. One is that um, you, you can harvest that winter grain, usually in July, that allows for planting of uh, red clover. Uh, a leguminous, um, what's sometimes called green manure, that if it's not harvested, it could just be adding nitrogen uh, that's fixed from the atmosphere to the soil. So adding a uh, uh, organic source of nitrogen fertilizer, or you can use uh, alfalfa, another leguminous crop, a forage crop, where we have uh, oats growing again in the light blue uh, in the second year of this rotation, and then the dark blue representing the perennial forage, uh, then going dormant over winter. And you can harvest alfalfa multiple times, depending on how long you want to put it in rotation. Uh, many farmers do a couple years to three years before going back to a grain crop. So that brings me to the research. That gives you a little bit of background. Now I'm going to talk about a specific experiment that was established by my colleague, uh, now Professor Emeritus, uh, Dr. Matt Liebman. He was in the agronomy department. He initiated this experiment called the Marsden Agroecosystem Diversity Experiment in 2001. It has three cropping systems that I'll describe in a moment that uh, will play off those diversified rotations I just explained. Uh, the plots are 18 by 84 meters and four blocks, meaning four replicates that are kind of outlined here in these uh, red lines. And the, you can see just based on the greenness, the different crops that are growing. And so we have each phase of the rotation represented in these two. So, um, and I'll explain those phases here in the next slide. This is the three treatments and kind of how they're laid out. So the business as usual is a two year corn soybean rotation. All the fertility comes from synthetic fertilizer. There's a three year rotation. So corn, soybeans, oats, and that red clover that can uh, be used as a green manure or forage crop. And then composted cattle manure makes up a large proportion of the, the fertilizer requirements with some supplemented synthetic fertilizer. That's why there's a, uh, the, the synthetic fertilizer shown in that smaller box next to the composted cattle manure. Then we've got the four-year rotation, that's corn, soybean, the second year, oats as a companion crop or nurse crop, alfalfa in that same year, and then one more year of alfalfa before going back to corn. Uh, like the three-year, the composted cattle manure makes up the majority of the fertility, greater than 90%, but is, is uh, supplemented with synthetic fertilizer based on soil fertility testing. So Marsden is actually one of the most sampled studied 
several acres of I, of land in Iowa. There's been 20 year and and still going. I'm I'm now managing this experiment. Uh, there's a 21 year and going record of cropping data with each phase of the rotation represented. There have been more than 38 peer reviewed publications. That was my last count using data collected from Marsden. It's been a nice project to work on. Dozens of collaborating scientists, including weed ecologists, soil scientists, economists, microbiologists, plant pathologists, food nutritionists, crop modelers, and many others. And then I mentioned the funding already. I, I thank these folks that we've received millions of dollars in funding for the experiment over the years. So I'm going to talk some more specifics about the research my team has done on soil health at the Marsden farm. A little bit before of uh, background before I jump into those data is I wanted to explain how I think about soil health. As I mentioned earlier, uh, many uh, researchers even can agree on what soil health is and, and everyone has their own definitions. I like to think of soil health as just how well a soil performs these functions. These are different soil functions or another term for them is ecosystem services, soil ecosystem services that are arrayed around this pinwheel from the Food and Agriculture Organization. And many of them are more related to environmental and agronomics than others, but soils function as a, a repository for cultural heritage or artifacts. That's what archaeologists care about. Soil is also a foundation for human infrastructure, shown here by this bridge. Uh, some of my engineer colleagues are thinking about that function of soil a lot. But these are the ones I've highlighted in red that our uh, soil organic matter is kind of central to. These are all the functions that I think about on a more regular basis as an agronomist and environmental scientist. So provisioning food, fiber, and fuel, carbon sequestration is a hot topic these days, water purification and soil contaminant reduction. So water quality issues we talked about, climate regulation, uh, nutrient cycling, a habitat for organisms, and then regulating floods or soils can store water or slow and, and, and allow water to infiltrate and, and prevent runoff. So these are kind of the functions I'm going to kind of come back to and show some metrics that address one or more of these. As I talk about them in the context of the Marsden Agroecosystem Diversity Experiment, and I have to give credit to Rebecca Baldwin Cordick. She was a uh, master student of mine, now a farm planner at MAD Agriculture. Murganka Day uh, was a postdoc in my lab, now assistant professor in, uh, of, the, in, of biology at uh, Minnesota State University in Mankato. And they sampled soils at Marsden 15 years after it was established in 2017. And so what we found in a nutshell, kind of a, a spoiler alert, is that there were overwhelming soil health benefits of that four-year rotation. And this is a uh, quite a complex slide, but I'll, I'll walk you through it slowly and kind of pick out some of these uh, different soil health parameters. So this is a what's called a spider web or a radar plot, and it shows this array of physical, biological, and chemical soil health indicators. Don't worry about it. Many of them are abbreviated. You might be able to figure out some of them. I'm going to go over a few of them specifically just to highlight them. And we break them down into physical, biological, and chemical soil health indicators. And the idea is that the further the line is out on this radar plot from zero up to one, so the further outside to the edge of the plots are, the healthier or better the ind indicator is. And so you could see just from overall glance at this graph, and the, uh, the area around it, I should say, is also the, the uh, standard error, so some variance around there. But overwhelmingly, except for a few biological metrics, actually, and that was qu quite an uh, unexpected finding we had in this study, uh, the four-year was uh, overwhelmingly uh, more healthy according to these metrics. And I, speaking of the study, uh, Rebecca baldwin Cordick was the fir first author. We published the study last year. Uh, there'll be a link to it below this video if you want to find out more information about our findings. I'm going to go through and just hit a few of the highlights. I'm going to talk about soil water that we found uh, over a growing season during when both rotations were in corn. I'm going to talk about soil hardness, penetration resistance with a, a cone penetrometer, some findings we have there that kind of gives you the ability for roots to grow in the soil. 
I'm going to talk about microbial biomass. This is just the overall biomass of uh, microorganisms like uh, bacteria, fungi, uh, and some soil animals that are microscopic. It's just their overall mass. I'm going to talk about our findings with earthworms and earthworm abundance. And then our findings with uh, nitrogen, three nitrogen pools, salt extractable organic nitrogen, total nitrogen, and nitrate, which is one that's of concern for water quality issues that I'll come back to as well. So this is the uh, water content. So just gravimetric water content. So grams of water per gram of dry soil. So you can multiply it by 100 to get a percent. And on the x-axis are three years of data. So when the rotation was in each rotation, the two-year and four-year was in the corn phase in 2017, both in the soybean phase in 2018, and then the rotations diverged and the two-year went back to corn. But in 2019, the four-year was in oat alfalfa. And we see across all these phases that the four-year rotation has more gravimetric water content and even in times of the year when soils are, are drier, uh, all soils are drier in Iowa, like in um, August and September, and crops are really water limited. This is from zero to six inches of soil, and we found on average about a 16% increase in uh, gravimetric water content across those three years. And we haven't done the statistics on it, but th that's the average increase. Um, we had done the statistics on this. This is statistically significant. There's an 8% decrease in resistance to root growth in the four-year rotation compared to the six-year. So on the bottom is the pressure or resistance to a root growing. This is simulated with the penetrometer. And we push the penetrometer into uh, the soils past a foot. Uh, a foot would be 30 centimeters here on this chart, which is on the y-axis or the axis, the vertical axis on the left. And the four-year rotation, the blue line with the air, the area around it is uh, uh, significantly less, 8% less on average than the um, uh, two-year rotation at the zero to six inch depth. In other words, it's easier for roots to grow in that diversified rotation. We also found that uh, the diversified rotation increases just the biomass or the amount of soil organisms, uh, microbes, by 62% at that zero to six inch depth compared to the four year. And you'll see again, this is similar to the gravimetric water content data, but three years uh, where the two of the years, the two rotations were in the same crop. So in the 2017, 2018, uh, both rotations were in corn and soybean, respectively. And the soil microbial biomass, regardless of what time of year, is greater than um, the two-year rotation. And I want to step back and say, I'm showing you a lot of these aspects of soil health, and I'm, I'm going to try to link it to some of the larger-term sustainability indicators and just productivity. And we don't know which one exactly is linked to it. But all of these point to the same direction of a healthier soil, more efficient soil, at delivering nutrients to the crop. A second kind of interesting finding while we're talking about soil biology is we found that there are 71% more earthworms in the four-year rotation down to that uh, six-inch, 15-centimeter depth. And here's a picture of, of some of those earthworms we collected from one of the plots here on the left. And so er why are earthworms important? Well. A uh, meta-analysis or a study of studies has found that inclusion of earthworms increases crop yields, regardless of the crop, on average by 25%. So we know that worms have these beneficial ecosystem services they're delivering, helping to provide nutrients, aerate the soil that can improve plant growth. Another aspect of the biology that's uh, more related to nitrogen or a nutrient we care a lot about in the Midwest and in Iowa is that we found that there's more nitrogen in microbes and in, organ in an organic form that's less likely, likely to leach in the four-year rotation compared to the two-year. So I'm going to show four forms of nitrogen. So many of you are probably familiar with ammonium and nitrate. Those are the forms of nitrogen that are inorganic. It's easy for plants to take up. That's usually what uh, synthetic fertilizer sources have one of the two of those are, are, are ammonia-based, and those are, are easy for crops to take up. 
S-E-O-N, we, we abbreviate Cion, is salt extractable organic nitrogen. So this is nitrogen that we can easily extract with a slightly salty solution that, that hasn't been mineralized and converted to ammonium and nitrate yet, but we think is probably a source of microbe food or potentially mineralizable over a growing season. And then finally, the MBN, microbial biomass nitrogen, is the nitrogen that's actually in the bodies of microbes that uh, are cycling rapidly and being released, but also some is taken up into those bodies. And so these two graphs on your left show those four types of nitrogen, and we call pools of nitrogen, over a year when both of those phases were in corn. So it was in that first year that I showed from some of those other slides. The two year is on the left, the maize and soybean, or the maize soybean rotation with synthetic fertilizer. The four year is on the right, maize, soybean, oat, alfalfa, and another year of alfalfa that also receives manure. And I'm sure you notice right off the bat that there's more uh, nitrogen total uh, or these e extractable or available pools or dynamic pools of nitrogen total in the four-year rotation. But what you might not notice right away is that more of that nitrogen is in salt extractable organic nitrogen and microbial biomass nitrogen uh, as a proportion. And in fact, that, that higher in those, those plots, the kind of lighter red and lighter blue colored uh, forms of nitrogen are uh, much smaller relative to the the darker, more organic pools of nitrogen that are in the the microbes and that salt extractable organic nitrogen. We think that this is uh, maybe contributing to kind of nutrient supply later in the growing season. Of course, this is something we haven't tested yet, but we hope to follow up on. The other thing you'll notice is nitrate in general is just lower in the four year rotation. So nitrate is the second to top of those graphs. It's kind of not the lightest, but the second lightest uh, red and blue color. There's hardly any ammonium in the four-year rotation under uh, when we sampled across this entire growing season, but even the nitrate is lower in the soil. And I'll come back to that when I get to the imp implications of, uh, on, of this for water quality. If we look at total nitrogen, so um, total nitrogen is all forms organic and inorganic, not just what we can extract with uh, that weak salt solution or, or is in microbial biomass. And total nitrogen concentrations in the soil is about 0.25% in the two year and 0.31% in the four percent or in the four year. And it's slightly higher, but it's not significantly higher in the four year rotation. But what I want to alert you to is now I've expressed those pools as a proportion of total in. And even though there's more nitrogen when you add manure and you have alfalfa, a uh, nitrogen fixing leguminous crop, more of that nitrogen is in those slow, what I call slow release forms, microbial biomass nitrogen and salt extractable organic nitrogen. And we have not published these data yet. We're working on a publication but um, uh, some of the details that we found are in that uh, uh, Baldwin Cordic paper from 2002. Okay, so I wanna return to that, that study and, and this complex graph now. Now I actually have the raw data surrounding the pinwheel, so making it even more complex. Um, some other things that I left out that I just didn't have time to explain here in this Crops TV episode is that there was 26% reduction in bulk density or the mass of soil per volume. And this tracks with the, the hardness or ease of roots to, go, to grow through the four-year rotation soil too. So that makes sense. There's a 16% increase in cation exchange capacity. This is kind of the size of the storage bank to hold those cation nutrients. So that's another benefit of four-year rotations. We saw a 10% increase in pH likely from the uh, manure, which can add some uh, carbonates and, and uh, can increase pH, composted cattle manure in many cases. And then we also see a paired increase in the salt extractable carbon. Again, this we kind of refer to this as microbe food. This is uh, organic uh, extractable compounds that are in uh, the soil. All right, so what I'm going to do is kind of sum up um, some other research and relate it to those uh, soil health benefits. I, I don't think it's a coincidence. We can't 
draw a straight line between some of those findings I mentioned and these, but I, I don't think it's a coincidence. And uh, this is a table based on uh, previous publications that we actually have in, in, uh, included in our paper. So it summarizes many studies that, that uh, Dr. Matt Liebman and his colleagues have published over the years. And on the left has uh, categories, so productivity and profitability of the four-year versus the two-year rotation, the cropping system, external inputs needed, and the environmental impact, and then some references. So we see the corn yield, and then oh, I, I forgot to mention the effect size, that's just the percent difference. So we, I, I'll show the, the raw mean um, which is 168 bushels per acre in the two year, 169 in the four year. So it's a, a small increase, uh, but it is statistically different. The soybean is a bit more so. We see greater increase in soybean. So the four year is 54 bushels compared to 445, uh, a 21% increase. If you look at the whole rotation profitability, the four year is more profitable, requires more labor, but it's more profitable. It's about 5% more profitable, but not significant. These are in these papers. Uh, the references are here on the, the right, and I will provide those as well. And then we, if we also look at the in, uh, external inputs, this goes into that profitability calculation, but less synthetic fertilizer is needed for the corn, nitrogen fertilizer for the corn year, uh, 159 on average, for the two-year rotation, 14 pounds per acre uh, in the four-year, so just small supplemental. Herbicides, 50% uh, less herbicides are needed for the uh, four-year rotation. That's one of the, the main benefits is the reduction in herbicide needed. Um, also fossil fuel energy, 65% uh, reduction in fossil fuel energy for uh, including the, the oats and alfalfa and manure. And then some of the other environmental impacts that I think are not, are not co a coincidence with the, um, the soil health data that I just showed you, but in nitrate in the groundwater at 1.2 meters depth, we find a 22% reduction in uh, the diversified rotation. Uh, we see a 62% reduction in soil erosion, 2.2% tons of soil lost per acre per year compared to the 5.8. And I guess what I'm trying to explain here is that there's just overwhelming benefits, environmental and productivity benefits to the four-year rotation, including the soil health data I showed before. However, one question we're currently trying to answer is, does uh, these improvements in soil health also mean that we're building a, uh, a, a cropping system in a soil that's more resilient to climate change. And, and I'll explain what I mean about that. So we know springs are getting wetter in Iowa. This is a, a, a modeled map of projected changes in spring precipitation. 15%, most of the, the uh, state of Iowa is expected to get 15% wetter by 2050. And these changes are going to make a, a problem that's already uh, pretty common to many Iowa producers that it's tough to get out early in the spring, have fertilizer applications, other equipment passes, and a wetter spring is just going to make things worse. And here's the data kind of behind that modeled map. This is the historical precipitation in inches from 1900 to 2010 in Iowa. And the bars are the five-year average, whereas the individual points are the yearly data. And you can see the five-year average, the bars, and the individual points are exceeding that average, uh, that dark black line that's just below 10 inches. And that's where we're coming up with this idea that springs are getting wetter. But not only are we having to deal with wetter springs, but growers are going to have to deal with more variable precipitation in the summer. So the graph on the left shows that total spring precipitation but the, the one on the right shows the total summer precipitation. There's not a change in the average, or I, I should say a direction where it's getting wetter in the summer, but we see more fluctuation from year to year. So you could get a very, very wet year like 1993, which I think is that, that dot that's really high, that's above 25 inches. Maybe it's 1994 or five compared to a year like 2012, which is one of the driest on record, 
in that 2010 to 2014 bar, you can see at the bottom of that bar. So we're getting these uh, large fluctuations in summer precipitation. So, and this tracks and links back to the graph I showed earlier about the, um, the more diversified four-year rotation having more soil moisture over the growing season, and there was more plant available uh, water holding capacity as well. And really the question is, can we re-diversify farms to uh, be more resilient or um, not be negatively impacted to these large fluctuations in summer precipitation or the, the increase in spring precipitation? One other aspect I haven't talked much about is that extreme events are also increasing. So these are the number of days with precipitation of two inches or more. And that, like the spring precipitation, is kind of going up, especially in the last several decades. Uh, at least from 1970, you see those blue bars increasing over the that dark line, the mean, which we used to get about one and a half days with precipitation over two inches or more, but now we're closer to two. So where does Marsden fit into this? So we've got a research question that how does this diversifying uh, rotations make the four-year rotation more resilient to these changes in climate? If so, and how? The way we're testing this is uh, with Iowa Soybean Association. They've uh, uh, generously donated a grant to help us build these rainout shelters. So we're going to roll these out over the two-year rotation and the four-year and see and actually see uh, if the data match this, if the four-year rotation can sustain uh, yields when we purposely drought them with these rainout shelters pictured here. We also want to know, and we get uh, a lot of questions from growers about this, what happens if we stack these other conservation practices like no-till and cover crops? I didn't really address those in this experiment at Marsden, at least not yet, but just recently we are now having, um, and we're splitting up some of those plots and going to test if we have cover crops in between the um, uh, corn and soybean year, and if we converted the whole experiment to, to no-till. So I didn't mention this, but the experiment is has different intensities of tillage, uh, the most intense tillage, uh, with chisel plows in the two-year, but we do use a moldboard plow in the four-year rotation, or we did, but now we've just uh, converted all of the rotations to no-till. We're calling this Marsden 2.0. So we don't have answers to these questions yet, but these are exciting research questions that hopefully I can report to you on a, a, a future Crops TV episode. I just want to end with sometimes moving forward requires looking backwards, as, I, as the title of my talk alluded to, you know, what are we missing from grandpa's rotation? I think humans in general, we have many biases, but one of them is progress bias, right? Just because now corn and soybeans with large equipment and everything it, uh, has moved towards this direction, that's the way to do things. But I think we might miss out on some benefits and, and what can we look for ways to re-diversify, but using some of the same technologies uh, more modern day technologies to diversify these agro ecosystems, but still get the same benefits um, that we used to with these longer rotations that also include uh, animal manure. What what are the agronomic and benefits or environmental benefits that we might get from re-diversifying our corn and soybean system? And at this time, I'd, I'd just like to end the talk. I hope you have some questions. Uh, you can put them in the the Canvas question feed here. You can are, are also free to email me at marsh at iestate.edu. And as I mentioned, we have a, a lab Twitter page too that goes over a lot of the research, including research from Marsden. And this is just another way to diversify. So this is a, uh, a uh, this photo here, this beautiful photo is a picture of a um, a prairie strip embedded in a, a corn soybean rotation where there's been a, um, a regeneration of natural prairie species planted between these uh, rows of corn. Thank you for your time and look forward to seeing you at another uh, season of Crops TV.